morning and this morning we're going to talk about Stephen a man filled with the Spirit you know I've been moving very slowly through the book of Acts but this morning we're going to cover about one chapter one one whole chapter and so uh, we will we turn to the Word of the Lord if you have your Bibles I'll have most of the scriptures up here but if you want to look with the with uh, if you want to look from your Bibles you're welcome to do that as well we're going to focus this morning on Stephen we met Stephen last week or the time before the church had a need. The need was for servants, for people to help serve the tables and to oversee the giving to the, um, uh, to the widows in the church. And the apostles said, this is not our job. Uh, by the way, we have translation if we need translation. Sorry, we just want to make sure every, we want to make sure everybody can hear. Can, can understand if we need translation. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so Stephen is one of the seven that is chosen and as the apostles and the servants use their gifts for the common good, the need is met, harmony is restored, and the church continues to grow with God's blessing. So we have talked about this. Of the seven men that are chosen, we only hear more about two of them, although I think we sort of see the others throughout the book of Acts. The only two that we learn anything more about will be Stephen and Philip. And Stephen pretty much is just in this one chapter, these one and a half chapters or so. So we're going to hear more about these two. Uh, next week we'll start hearing about Philip, but we're not going to hear about Steve, uh, no, we're not going to hear very much about Philip today. We're going to, we're going to talk about Stephen. The story of Stephen is one that we know very well because almost all of us, if we know the Bible, we know that Stephen is the first, what? The first martyr of the church. He's the first follower of Jesus who is martyred and he's, he's known for that. And almost all of us know the story. If we know the Bible even a little bit, we know that um, he began to serve in the church. We know that he began to, God empowered him to, uh, to perform miracles. And then we find out that he was, because he was full of the wisdom of God, that when he spoke and when he, he, was, he was very persuasive, nobody could stand against him. And then opposition arose. Uh, we, his story is famous because we know that Saul was part of it, right? Saul was part of the lynch mob, is what we would say in the U.S. Saul leads the, uh, leads the charge against Stephen, and Stephen is martyred, and we know that the story of Stephen sort of seems to end with Saul. In, in chapter 8, verse 1, uh, it's, it's almost a, it's a chilling uh, it's a chilling verse, if you want to think of it. In, in chapter 8, verse 1, it says, and Paul, uh, a paraphrase was, and Paul fully agreed with the killing of Stephen. That's a modern translation of that. So it's really a chilling uh, end, it seems to be, to the story of Stephen. But we're going to look at Stephen today. And as we look at Stephen, um, I was really praying about this because, as I was preparing, because I thought, Lord, I don't want to just give a, uh, Lord, I don't want to just give a history lesson, or this happened, this happened, this happened. God, what is there about the life and the story of Stephen that speaks to us today as well as as Christians, and I believe the Lord gave some has has, gave, uh, has given further understanding. We're going to look at some things, but we do want to look a little bit historically as well, and it will help us for ourselves. And so, I, as we think about Stephen, you saw that you see the title Stephen, a man filled with the Spirit, and that I think more than anything else is what you could say about Stephen. If somebody were to encapsulate your life in a few words, what would they say? I, I think about that for just a minute. Uh, for me, Jennifer, a woman, what? Uh, um, Malou, a woman, what would be said within the family of God, within the church of God? And I believe that is one of the main points that the life of Stephen speaks to us this morning as well. And as we look at Stephen, so it's a man filled with the Spirit, we want to, we're going to go through just a few things where it talks about this, this man, Stephen, who was so filled with the Spirit of God. And one of them we'll get to at the end. But let's start with Acts uh, 6, 3. And this is before we really have met Stephen. But I want us to look at this because I think there are 
there, there's just a phrase here that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about, but I think speaks to us this morning. The apostles tell the, the church family, now they say brothers because it's a Greek custom, right? This is the Acts is written, is written in Greek, but in fact it was brothers and sisters, so men and women. Uh, the church, the new church was extremely radical. It gave place, it gave place to women when before in that society women had a much, much lower place um, in society with many restrictions and many limitations. And so what it means is brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. So the requirement for service was to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. They had to have God's, the, God's power and equipping to, to perform this ministry to perform this service uh, from the very, very beginning. But that's not what I want us to look at. What I want us to look at is this expression. What do they say? Uh, not yet. It says they are known to be full of the Spirit. Now, I want you to think with me for just a minute. They are known to be full of the Spirit. But remember, at this time, who was doing all of the preaching? Who? The apostles. Peter, Peter probably more than others, but the apostles were. Nobody else was preaching. Well, how do you know if somebody's really spirit-filled or not? Unless you can hear how they preach. Woof, really spirit-filled. Nobody else was preaching. And yet, the apostles say, somebody who's known to be full of the Spirit. Who was performing signs and wonders in the church? Everyone or just the apostles? Just the apostles. Only apostles. Well, how can you know somebody's full of the Spirit or not if they're not doing great things and performing signs and wonders? There had to be something about the lives of these people, an overflow, <clears throat> a fullness, a flourishing, a Christ-likeness, a beauty, a winsomeness, a gentleness, a spark, a life that in some way was like Jesus because the Spirit always speaks of Jesus. That's what He does. The Spirit makes us like Jesus. Where we're not like Jesus, when the Spirit fills us, He comes in, He makes us like Jesus. Where we're rough and hard, and where Jesus is gentle and kind, the Spirit comes in and He makes us like Jesus. So there had to be something that was obvious in the lives of these people, that they're full of the Spirit. They're not preaching and teaching, but I can tell they're full of the Spirit. They're not performing miracles, but they're full of the Spirit. And so the question I believe for you and for me this morning, and I, ha I don't have all of this figured out yet, I'll be really honest with you, but the question I believe for us in this part is, could the same thing be said in the family of God of our lives this morning? If, one of your, if people were around you in the family of God, as you're together, as you go out and eat, as you're having fun together, as you're worshiping together, as you're having your small groups together, as you're fellowshipping, as you're serving one another, could it be observed? Could and would we be known as someone who is full of the Spirit? That's kind of a hard question to answer, isn't it? It puts us on the spot just a little bit, doesn't it? Because we usually say, oh, full of the Spirit, they do this, they do this, they do that. It seems to me that the evidence of the fullness of the Spirit in the lives of these seven men was something very different than from what you and I usually look at. There was something in them that everyone could tell, this person is really full of the Spirit of God. That's what I want for my life. Is that what you want for your life? I hope so. I hope so. So that was the requirement. Did Stephen meet the requirement? Next one. They chose Stephen, sure enough, a man full of faith or grace and of the Holy Spirit. So there was something about Stephen. It was very, very clear. He was a man full of faith. The other word for that is grace and of the Holy Spirit. And this was something that was in his daily life. It was in his daily life. As far as I know, Stephen must have had some sort of secular job as well. He had to eat, right? 
He was a man in his prime. He had to have, he had to work in some way. But there was something about him in his daily life that spoke of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So I challenge you again this morning, and I challenge myself, is there that in us that day by day in our daily lives speaks of the fullness of the Spirit in our lives? Is there? There should be. And then we go a little bit further. Stephen is obviously such a person. He's chosen, he serves tables, he oversees food distribution, but we don't hear anything else about it. And the very next thing we read, literally, two or three verses later, we see in Acts 6, 8, now Stephen, again, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. So here we are, we don't read anything else about waiting on the tables, and instead we suddenly now see Stephen, he's doing what the apostles were doing. Well, where did that come from? How did that happen? How did he get promoted, if you will, from waiting on tables and serving tables to now doing the works that the apostles were doing in the power of the Holy Spirit? That nobody else had done that. And now we see Stephen, the very first one, outside of the apostles. So he's doing all of these great things. He's doing this and he's doing that through God's grace and power. And he did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. When we are full of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, when we are full of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Spirit, the power of God, the grace of God overflows our lives and God will surprise us with what He can do through us. He will. We think this is how God is going to use me. Let me tell you, when you and I get full of the Spirit of God, God will do more always than we imagined, than we thought, than we expected, than we planned. I've got a very big God. We just sang that this morning, right? We've got a big, big God. And brothers and sisters, when that big, big God fills us and overflows, big things can happen. Big things can happen. I, I, believe, that's, I believe that's what God wants to do. Not just centered in the apostles, not just centered in the pastors and the worship leaders. Stephen really was nobody special in the church. He was, he was a servant. He was a servant. How many of us are, are servants? Most of us, many of us. He was just serving. He was just serving. But he was full of the Spirit of God. And his, the fullness of God overflowed in his lives and great things happened. Miraculous things happened. And so we see this man, Stephen, full. And then a little bit later, we'll get to it, not right now, the next one, Acts 7.55, you're going to see one more passage where it talks about Stephen full of the Holy Spirit. We may not get quite to that one this morning, but if you're taking notes, you can just mark right there. We'll come to it just a little bit later. And so here is Stephen. Now, I want to talk about this for just a minute. He has the gift of service, and now it seems he has the gift of working miracles and signs. That's a big jump, isn't it? From this to this. Well, how did that happen? Well, that doesn't really seem fair. See, I just have one little tiny small gift. Why does he get so many gifts and such big gifts? My gift is small and tiny and not noticeable. What happened in the life of Stephen from here to here? There's a biblical principle, brothers and sisters, that we must hold on to as we look at serving God and the gifts, and it's found in, throughout the New Testament in the teachings of Jesus, but we see in Matthew 25, 21, slide 3, here's a parable of Jesus uh, that he gives, and this is, as I said, it's found in many other places. I'm just taking one scripture this morning for the sake of time. Uh, Jesus tells the parable, and he, the, the master replied, this servant took what the master had given him, and he used it well, and as he used it, it was multiplied. Brothers and sisters, that is a perfect example of the gifts of God that he puts in us for the blessing of the church. It's a perfect example. Here's this gift. 
God puts it in us for the good of the church. We use that gift, that gift blesses others. It's, it's something that is fruitful. It's something that's fruitful. And so it multiplies in its effect. It's just, it seems like this one small thing, but its effect is multiplied through your life and the lives of others. That's a perfect example. And it says, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Brothers and sisters, here's the principle for you this morning. If you will be faithful where you are, if you will be a good steward with what you have, well, I don't have much. Be faithful with it. Well, it's very small. Use it, even if it's small. Well, it's not much. If it's not much, put it in the hands of God and let God do something with it. Take what God has given you, what you have, where you are. Instead of looking at the limitations, instead of looking at the smallness, instead of looking at the unimportance, do, use, give, share what God has given you and let God multiply and increase it. You and I can never increase the gift of God in our lives. That's another principle for us. What was the, the story of the five loaves and the two fish? That little boy didn't have much. It wasn't enough to meet the need, but he had it. And instead of saying, well, I've only got five loaves and two fish, he took it and he gave it to Jesus and Jesus blessed it. There was a thankfulness for the little that was there. And sometimes we have just little in our lives. Maybe our giftings are small. Maybe our area of influence seems very small. And we kind of, hmm, we grumble and complain just a little bit. I encourage you to do what we see pictured in the New Testament. Be thankful for it. Do something with it. Don't just put it in your back pocket and say, well, I'm going to wait till God gives me something better and then I'll use it. If you put it in your back pocket and wait until God gives you something better and bigger and more outstanding to use, you will never go further in the Lord. It will remain in your back pocket and God's not going to give you more because you haven't done anything with what you have. That's a principle. Please don't get upset with me. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. If you want to flourish in your Christian life, take what God has given you and use it. You say, well, I, I don't really know how. Just say, God, help me use this gift and just start doing it. You say, but I'm really imperfect. He puts his treasures in earthen vessels. That's what the Bible says. He puts his treasures. Are you imperfect? I'm imperfect. I'm imperfect. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. We're not good enough. God is good enough. He gives us treasures. It's in earthen vessels. It's in imperfect vessels. God tr entrusts us with these gifts, even knowing that we might not get it right, even knowing that we might not really know what to do with it and how to do it. God still puts his gifts in us for the good of the church. And I challenge you, do you want to flourish in the Lord? Do you want to flourish in the Lord? Use the gifts he's given you. And if you will, with a good heart and a good attitude to the best of your ability, say, Lord, help me to do this in your strength. I promise you, I promise you, God will cause you to flourish. You will grow. And you know what I have found? God will give you more. That's the principle. That's what Stephen did. That's what Stephen did. Now, one other thing to look at, and that's found in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. Remember, I gave you four chapters. Do you, you don't remember, do you? Four chapters? If you want to find out, if you want to read about gifts, spiritual gifts in the Bible, you look at four chapters. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. Got it? You forgot that, didn't you? Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. Those are the four chapters for you. And it says in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes in chapter 12, verse 11, he said, it is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone, he alone decides which gift each person should have. God's the one who decides it. I might do it differently, wouldn't you? I think I might say, well, well you, you'd be good at this, or th you, you're going to do this. God is the one who decides. And so when we have questions... I encourage you, just go to God and talk to God about it. He decides. Wow, this is the great Paul. The Paul who could have said, here, let me pray for you. I'll give you this gift and I'll give you that gift. Nope. Paul says he's the one who decides. And so God looks at Stephen 
And Stephen is faithful, serving the tables. And God e equips him and gifts him with more. That's what God does. So Stephen honors the Lord and blesses the church. And as he does that, opposition begins to rise up. And they begin to oppose Stephen and argue against Stephen. Now, how many of you in school loved history and geography? Those were just your favorite subjects. History and geography, me either, Stephen. Do you know that Sister Betty back in the U.S. now, oh, she could name all the states, all the, all the capitals, all the whatever. So whenever we would play a game, I'd always want her on my side because I was so bad in that area. Um, let's, go, let's go with a little history and a little geography lesson in verses 9 and 10. You say, mm, really? Really? Look with me at Acts 6, 9 and 10. And we're going to look at the opposition that rises up. And this tells us something about the story of, St of Stephen that I think we'll find interesting. So opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen. Okay, stop there just a minute. This was in Jerusalem. So in Jerusalem, there was a temple, right? Why would there be a synagogue also in Jerusalem when they, and there would have been more than one synagogue. This was a particular synagogue. Why didn't they just go to the temple? There, this, the temple is there. Why have synagogues? Okay, let me ask you something. Where did Jesus do most of his teaching? Synagogues. Where did Paul do most of his teaching when he traveled around? In the synagogues. So what took place in the synagogues? The synagogues were places where men and women, Jewish men and women or converts to Judaism, would gather and there would be, uh, it would be usually higher and there would be usually a bench benches or seats around three sides and then there would be a higher area and the teacher or the reader in the synagogue would go to the higher area and those of high position like the teachers of the law they would sit in the cha they would sit in the chairs on the three sides and everybody else like you and like me we would sit on the floor in the dust in the middle and then in that there would be uh, prayers there would be discussion there would be reading of the first five books of the Bible so that's what took place in the that's what took place in the synagogues it was much more uh, it was much more practical and much more interactive so probably this was where Stephen was a member of before he was converted was Stephen Hebrew speaking or Greek speaking Greek speaking, remember when they chose the seven men, they said you choose seven men and all seven of the men were Greek speaking to meet the needs of the Greek speaking widows. So that was most likely, that was Stephen's background. And so here comes Stephen, here is this synagogue and it says members of the synagogue of the freedmen as it was called. Who were the freedmen? The freedmen were former slaves and their children, they'd been slaves of Rome, and then they had gotten their freedom, and then they had come back to Jerusalem where they were living there, and they and their children, probably, that's where they would have come from. So it was called the synagogue of the freedmen. At one time they'd been, at one time they'd been slaves, now they were free. And so they would gather there, they'd still go to the temple on the Sabbath, but the rest of the time they would go to this synagogue. Now stay with me, you're kind of saying, are we getting to, yep, we're going to get to part of the story a little bit further. Now, where did these people come from? Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These are the men who began to argue with Stephen. Aha! Uh -huh. Now, our Bible geography may not be very good, but here we have Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria. So probably Stephen was from one of these areas originally, as well as the province of Cilicia. In the province of Cilicia, there was one main city. And one of the main cities of Cilicia was a city that was called Tarsus. Oh, what character in the New Testament was from the city of Tarsus? Paul slash Saul. Saul of... Tarsus. That's right. Saul of Tarsus. Now we don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us exactly, but it is very possible and a lot of Bible scholars believe it's likely that Paul or Saul himself may have been part of this synagogue because they were from the provinces of Cilicia. So he may have been 
part of that. Now, look a little bit further. What else does it say? These men began to argue with Stephen. Who is the best orator? Who is the best debater in the book of Acts? The very best one. Who? Saul slash Paul, right? The book of Acts is about, he debated with them. He argued with them. He presented proofs. What if, as we consider it, what if Paul, Saul, was part of this? And Paul was known as, he was the one that could beat, he could beat everybody in an argument, right? Have you ever been around somebody that can always win an argument? <laughs> they can always win an argument? Drives you crazy, doesn't it? You don't even want to be around them. They always win. I can never beat them in an argument. They always win. I imagine Saul was like that. He always won every argument. He knew the scriptures. He knew how to argue. He had, he had gone to the best school. He had learned from the best teacher, Gamaliel. He knew it all. And then, here is this man. Here is this man. Who's Stephen? He's not even a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's a Greek-speaking Jew. And yet, no one could stand against him in an argument. Why? Because Stephen was a man that was filled with the Spirit of God. He was filled with the Spirit of God. Are you facing difficulties in your life? Are you facing obstacles that you cannot overcome? Are you facing problems that are just too big for you and you look at it and you think, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle it. I don't know how. God, what can I do? Be filled with the Spirit of God because nothing can stand against the Spirit of God. Nothing can stand against the Spirit of God. And as Stephen speaks, no one, no one can stand against him. Now before some of you say, Pastor Jennifer, I think you might be reaching a little bit. How do we know this? We don't. But I ask you again, at the end of the story of Stephen, who is the one that leads the charge against Stephen to stone him and to approve his death. It is Saul. It is Saul. And so we see this, these two little verses that we thought, well, they're not, you know, it's just Bible names in there. It's not so interesting. It's not so important. It's part of the story. And so he, they cannot argue against him. They cannot stand against him. And Stephen proclaims the Messiah. Stephen really, when you look at what they say, Stephen proclaims Jesus has come. He has broken the barrier between God and man. Wow, what does that mean? That means we don't have to go to the temple anymore. What does that mean? We don't have to give sacrifices anymore. Jesus in his body gave the perfect sacrifice. What does that mean? There's really no need for a temple. Why? Because the kingdom of God is with man. These were things that would have been just, just hammer blows against traditional Jews. And that's what Stephen was standing and proclaiming. And so since they can't defeat him by truth, what do they do? They defeat him by trickery and lies. And they get false witnesses. And the false witnesses say, he said this, and he said that, and he said. And so what do they do? They bring Stephen to stand before Caiaphas, the high priest. He's the same high priest that condemned Jesus to death about two years earlier. That's the time frame, okay? And I encourage you, as you look at the life of Stephen, and I want you to go back and read this, because this is a long section, and we're only looking at a few verses. I want you to think about the comparison between Jesus and Stephen. And you will see that there are almost perfect parallels with the life of Stephen and the death of Stephen and the life and the death of Jesus as well. It's a perfect parallel. What does the word martyr? The word martyr means a witness. And we see in the life of Stephen and the death of Stephen a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I want to be witnesses for Jesus when it's easy, when it's comfortable, when we overcome. But I think the life and the death of Stephen show us that we can be witnesses for Jesus in the darkest of times, in the deepest of nights, in the greatest persecution and opposition, because Stephen is stoned to death. 
It seems that he loses the battle, doesn't he? But he doesn't. He's a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we'll look at the end, he says, Jesus, he says, Lord, you know what he says? He says, Jesus, receive my spirit. Remember what Jesus said? Father, receive my spirit. What else did Jesus say? Jesus said, don't hold this sin against them. What does Stephen say? Don't hold this sin against them. Forgive them. I give you my spirit. We see this beautiful, oh, truly, Stephen, what a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. What a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ because he was full of the Spirit. But anyhow, he's in front of the high priest and the high priest says, are these charges true? Now you know what? Of course they're not true, are they? Just as the high priest knew two years earlier when that troublesome Galilean Jesus stood in front of him, he knew that those charges weren't true either, didn't he? He says, are these charges true? And Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, begins not a defense of himself. He has a pretty good idea of, what's gonna, of how this is going to end. You, you know that? When you look at Stephen, when he begins to talk, there's a pretty good idea of the end result of this already. Stephen does not give a defense of himself. Stephen instead proclaims something that will revolutionize their world. And you say, what? Revolutionize their world? Huh. How many of you, here's a true confession, you come to chapter 7 of the book of Acts. Chapter 7 is the speech of Stephen. Okay? How many of you, when you read, Steve, Big Steve is smiling because I know what he... I, He's going to say the same thing I say. When I read the book of Acts, and I've read the book of Acts many, many, many times in the past, do you know what I used to do? I'd get to set chapter 7, the speech of Stephen. I would skim it or I would skip it. How many of you would be really honest and say, I kind of do that too? Yes? A few of us would say that. Why? It seems a little boring. It seems repetitive. Please don't think I'm being sacrilegious. I'm really not. I'm just being honest with you. And I think I've read it so many times. I already know about it. I know about why does he talk about Abraham? Why does he talk about Joseph and Moses? Why isn't he talking about Jesus the Messiah? I've read all of the, these things. I know all these things. Do you know that that's what I used to do with chapter 7? I'm just being honest with you this morning. Your pastor should be honest. As I told you, we're imperfect. And I would just skim through it because I thought, I already know this. I know this very well. May I give you just a little bit of help as I have waited on the Lord and as I've looked at this and as I have begun to understand what is going on in chapter 7? Stephen mentions three, three, mainly three people. And here's something that will help us understand why this is so important and why he talks about these people. We'll do it really quickly because our time is coming to a close. First of all, let's look at the next slide. First of all, he talks about Abraham. And he says, our forefather Abraham. And he starts talking about Abraham. Why does he talk about Abraham? That sure is going back a long way, isn't it? Why does he go all the way back to Abraham? Because Abraham is common ground for all of them. They're all Jews. They all look to their forefather Abraham. Abraham was the father. He was, the man, the, he was given the promise of God through your offspring. All the world, all the earth will be blessed. And he goes all the way back to Abraham. So Abraham is common ground. But Abraham is something else. Abraham never received the promise of God. It was something that was far off. The land that was promised, Abraham never got it. When God appeared to Abraham, where was Abraham? He was way over at Mesopotamia. Where's Mesopotamia? I can't even pronounce Mesopotamia. He was in an area that now we would call Iraq and parts of Syria. That's where Abraham was, in Iraq and parts of Syria. Now, please don't misunderstand me. How could God be glorified in Iraq or Syria? Do you know what I mean? That, that would be a way that we would think, right? In the same way they would say, well, how would God be glorified in North Korea? Oh my goodness, what a terrible place. I, I'm, do you understand what I'm saying? I, I'm, not, I'm not 
criticizing or condemning. I'm just, as we think about it naturally. But Stephen talks about Abraham because God appears to Abraham far from the land of promise, far from Palestine, far from Jerusalem. There's no temple. There's no tabernacle. There are none of those things that the Jews loved so much, right? The temple, the temple, the temple. They honored the temple more than they honored God. But outside of the temple, the great God, who's a very big God, appeared to Abraham and showed him his glory. God is not bound or limited by geographical boundaries, by the walls that this world puts up. God is a big God. And Stephen was talking about this big, big God. And he says, God appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia. He didn't have to be in Jerusalem. He didn't have to be at the temple. God is bigger than that. And so he talks about Abraham. And then who does he talk about next? He talks about Joseph. Well, why does he talk about Joseph? Because Joseph in the Old Testament is a type of Jesus. He's a type of Jesus. And Joseph, the first time, was rejected by his brothers and was persecuted. He was sent off to Egypt. And then the second time, the second time, his brothers recognized him. They accepted Joseph. And Joseph saved them, right? So why is Joseph mentioned? because Jesus was rejected by them the first time, but he would still come again, and they could receive him and be saved by him the second time. And so that's why Joseph is in the speech. Who, who else is mentioned? Who's next? Moses is mentioned. Why is Moses mentioned? And Moses is the longest one. Because Moses was connected to the law. Oh, they love the law. The law of God means that we are God's people. And then Stephen says, you have the law of God, but you don't follow the law of God. And brothers and sisters, we're kind of like that sometimes too, aren't we? I know the Bible. I go to Lighthouse. It's a good church that preaches the, that preaches the word of God and, and all of this and that. But are we in our lives obeying God? Are we following him? Or are we holding on to things? I go to this church. I know this and I know that. The living God has come into our lives and we follow him in obedience. And so... Stephen brings up Moses because he says, you have Moses. Moses also, remember, the first time he went to save his, his brethren out of Egypt, did they accept or reject? They rejected him. And then the second time, did they accept or reject? They accepted him. And so Moses, as the example, is mentioned as well. And so here comes Stephen with this, we thought it was a boring speech, didn't we? Abraham, Joseph, and Moses. And instead, it is a speech that completely does away with the past and says there is God. Look at the last, the last thing that really makes them so angry. The Most High does not live in houses made by men because he's coming to talk about Jesus the Messiah. The Most High, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, not in the temple not in Jerusalem, these things that, oh, they honored so much. But he says, God cannot be bound or limited by these things. Jesus came in the flesh, and Jesus lives in us. God does not live in things that are made by the hands of man. He's not limited. And when Stephen says that, do you know what Stephen is really saying? Stephen is saying what the apostles themselves have not yet really started to say or to do. Stephen basically is saying the salvation of God is for everyone. The salvation of God is not only for the Jews, it's for the Greeks. What? God likes good people and God likes bad people. God likes people that goes to church. And God likes those that never darken the door of a church. And he's a big God, and he has come. And that's what Stephen is saying. And that's what they can't accept. And that's why they rise up then and they rush against him. We come to a close this morning. We come to an end. But I encourage you this morning, 
and we'll finish this up. But we pretty much got through the chapter. So you can go back and read it, read it on your own. Um, next week we'll look at, at the, the very last few scenes of his death and what he says and how he says it. So inspiring, so encouraging. You say, death is inspiring and encouraging? Uh-huh, uh-huh, it is, it is. You will be so inspired and so encouraged. Because do you know what? The name Stephen comes from a Greek word, Stephanos. And do you know what it means? It means crown. Did you know that, Stephen? Maybe he did. It means crown. But it's a special type of crown. There are two types of crowns in the Bible. Stephanos means the crown that is earned. Not just given. It's the crown that is earned. And Stephen, in his life and in his death, earned the crown that will never fade, the crown of life, the crown of life, an earned crown. Oh, brothers and sisters, may you and I in our lives and maybe in our deaths, in the bright days and the dark nights, may we be Stephens, earning the crown of life, filled with the Holy Spirit, using the gift or the gifts that he has given us and flourishing in him. This is part of the story of Stephen. I think this is why this chapter is in part so long and so important. There's a lot more. That's just a little bit. Let's stop here for today. Lord, we thank you for our brother Stephen whom we shall meet one day in heaven as we remain faithful just as he was faithful. May we too in our lives, in our deaths, in our sunny days and in our dark nights earn the crown of life. May we too be filled with your spirit flourishing, overflowing, bringing life showing your glory day by day by day. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you, brothers and sisters. If you want to prepare for...